Hello there everyone and thank you for joining me here in TNO, the last years of Europe, using the Tsar and Soviet submod for, of course, TNO. I'm your host, Mr. Ragey Pants, but we got to talk about the bonfire of the Passionaries. The streets of Berezniki were a flight or a fire with talk of only one thing, the trial of the Passionary Party. With a line of people que queuing outside the trial venue hoping for admission. In the end, the courtroom was packed with as many spectators as it could safely handle. Aside from the space made around Kazim Beck and his generals on the balcony to ensure their safety and comfort, Alexander Livovich looked down at the face of the two convicts who had just been brought in the room. Two men in white shirts, one older one, the other one younger. The older one was Luv Gamaleyev, the Eurasianist, and the younger one was already allegedly some conservative fool, Igor Shevarevich. The Chief Justice directed his first remarks to Gamaleyev. He spoke about the men's lot before launching into a lengthy diatribe about the men's the failings and dilutions of the Eurasianist theory. No doubt the man was keen to pen into his unexpectedly large audience with a litany of insults he deployed. After what seemed like an hour of calling Gumilov an uncrazed traitor and murder, the judge paused for a moment as if to catch his breath. The next it was Shevarevich's turn to face the music. The judge also began to describe his life, his academic work, and his political activities. Next, the judge delivered a mocking impression of Shevarevich's voice, mimicking his own words as he said, You cannot engage in politics without knowledge of mathematics. The witness gallery laughed in unison as it displayed judicial theater. <coughs> Shortly thereafter, the judges retired briefly for deliberations. There was to be no defense, of course. All that needed to be said had been said. Minutes passed, and the judges merged once more to announce a verdict. Comrades, the court is ready to announce our verdicts. For Gumilov, the court looks very ne negatively upon his subversive political activities, his denial of Russian nationalhood, uh, his organization of extremism, and his promotion of a culture of fear. We have sentenced him to death. The judge announced with a disturbing smile as he turned to the page of his notes. Ah, but because of his psychological health, he will instead be taken to a psychiatric facility in hope that he will, time, in time, Come to a senses and face the gravity of what he has done. The crowd looked cheated and rejected the death they were denied. Gumilov, for his part, was none the wiser, having been dragged from the room faster than the judge could actually speak. Shevarevich announced the judge, for your political activities, your complicity, uh, complicity. with Gumilov and or your organization of violent crimes against the state, we sentence you to 20 years in prison with hard labor. The sentence, however, reduced to 10 years for good behavior at the region's behest and recognition of your contribution to mathematics. Now get out of my court. The witnesses began to discuss the sentences among themselves. Why put Gumilov in a straitjacket if he could simply be shot? He was the epicenter of it all, he didn't surely deserve to die for it. The region's mercy was inconsistent and erratic, but none dared to say so within his earshot. Its leaders may yet live, but the passionary party has finally been buried. The crowd wanted blood. And we have the end of the campaign. Kazimbeck and Belozersky was together in the region's office, enjoying fine cigars and contemplating the remarkable chain of events that had seen Berezniki rise from obscurity to be the sole authority in Western Russia. Having once been a small state of scattered towns and villages, the Mladerosi state had been toppled powerful enemies who, by any reasonable estimation, should have toppled the country in no, no time at all. Either Lord got himself luck or Khan's commands uh, helps uh, Berezniki survive the carnage of the Russian anarchy and subdues many rivals. Kazimbeck's happiness at his great triumph has been evident for all to see. He was recently notified by the last pocket of Bolshevik resistance had been stamped down in the far reaches of the Arctic coast, leaving no credible resistance to the young Russians in the region. Or have been restored around the country, and the people no longer live in fear of ideological fanatics or rampant banditry. Moreover, the triumph of the Mladerosi was achieved in a remarkably short period of time, sparing the Russian people the horrors of protracted war. Well, Zarsky thought over the developments carefully before adding his thoughts. As glad as I'm that we've united Russia under a flag, the more important question so remains what's next. Kazimbeck nodded politely and replied, Our task right now should be to consolidate power. And remember, Sergei, after the unification, we agreed to convene a Zemsky support. And simply the land, resolve issues regarding who should be the permanent head of state. Everyone knows that I'm only a regent, and I cannot govern a united Russia myself. As you can imagine, we must prepare the country for the election of a new ruler, and doing so will be our next step. And he told me at the time that you wanted to nominate me to the throne, or do you still want to? Of course, Sergei, in the meantime, I've considered another potential candidate for the throne, Maria Romanova. She's not old enough to rule the country, so the people choose her, I will be forced to remain as regent for a time, although not forever. I thought it wise to present the people with a clearer choice to avoid the perception that the monarch was illegitimate. Belzersky nodded. You say that Western Russia is united, but what about Omega? They claim <coughs> to be the vanguard against communism, but with Bolshevism defeated, it's abundantly clear that they only exist to serve the Finns. And her security surely depends on tearing it away from Finland's hands. The men remain eager to fight and would be gladly followed to any order to take it. We must stress the importance of patience, replied Kazimbeck. Well, Nega will wait. This state will not go anywhere and presents no direct danger to us at the moment. The consequences of provoking Finland before we have secured her state could be severe. Our task is now to organize the coronation. Of course, Alexander Livovich. For another hour, the two men discussed their lives and pondered the future politics of the state, hoping that with all their hearts that the Mladerosi ideals would long outlive them and their odd descendants. It's time to do what needs to be done. The electorate. For starting the elections themselves, we must first identify who will be able to cast ballots. This shouldn't be a difficult task, but nevertheless, we must settle a number of disagreements before we can convene the Zemsky Sabor. History has shown that electing a ruler in time of crisis can provide the strong leadership necessary to safeguard Russia's interests, as it did during the time of troubles. Just as the election of Michael I saw the end of a period of foreign domination, the election of Rowan Tsar was signaled an age where Russia can once again cast off foreign rule and unite the people behind a strong and noble leader. We, to ensure that such leaders chose, we must be mindful that the electorate themselves are committed to the freedom and security of the motherland.
So we can get do this, but we just need to lock a Sar first. So that's not bad. Um, I do apologize for the last couple videos for just being ragey. And, you know, I feel somewhat justified for being ragey because sometimes, my god, does this suck. Um, the pacing and stuff like that. I mean, my goodness. How, how frustrating it can be, but the moving day. Berezniki is a beautiful city that established itself as a very important part of Russian history. It was in that time that the Mladerosi and the Kazimbek settled, survived and flourished under the hail of German bombs and constant raids from our enemies in Perm. Thanks to our valiant efforts, we managed to turn Berezniki from half ruins into a prosperous city with industry and a fairly strong economy. Sadly, the need to relocate the capital from Berezniki to a larger metropolis has been talked about for a long time. In Mladerosi, Russia, united under the single banner of Berezniki, many people feel that the old capital had grown its usefulness. Even though this was the city that formed the beating heart of our campaign to subdue the warlords, it is clear that it is increasingly a hindrance to governance in peacetime. A larger, more prestigious capital is needed, one that has room to grow and build and has the population necessary to staff and maintain the institutions the government needed to establish ourselves as a sovereign state on the international stage. Everyone knows the names of the world capital, such as Berlin, Moscow, London, Washington, and others. And we need to acquire a city that will be similarly renowned worldwide. Again, such competitors, the valiant little city of Berezniki seems insignificant in comparison. Time's going to plan to move to a new capital. It must be a place in which we can establish a larger administrative, administrative hub and develop our economy without hindrance. Among all the cities that exist in Western Russia, the suitable options seem to be limited to only Siktivkar, the capital of the former Komi Republic, and Sviatka, the capital of the former Tsar Vladimir III. Both cities are equally suited to their old capital, but ultimate decision seems to be more sentimental and cosmetic than practical. It remains only to choose where the capital will be and where to convene the Zemsky support. Siktivkar? Vyatka. Aviaka. Candidates. We've finally been able to settle the composition of the forthcoming Zemsky Sabor and almost. Uh, everything is in place for the election of a new Tsar. It's now time to think about the candidates themselves. There are only two of them, and it's clear that both must be introduced properly to the people in the interest of the fair contest. The most important question remains who will vote for the whom? The pillars of society could align behind either candidate, and the contest could prove most interesting. So most interesting. Keep training, you bunch of scallywags. Oh, we have a little bit of debt, too. Look at that. Oh, oh, do we get a higher credit rating? Oh, that's nice. Get all the way up to fair, that'd be nice. We got a good amount of plus two for voters. Gazin, but despite the great victory that had already taken place, uh, continued to work as though the war for Russia and Russia was still underway. Even in a peaceful environment, the region was still caught upon to solve hundreds of the various sizes, or issues of the various sizes. The biggest issue of all remained the question of the Zemsky Sabor. The region had already determined the location of the Zemsky Sabor, but had yet to determine uh, or consider the manner by which the delegates themselves would be selected. This question was by no means a trivial one. There were many power blocks in the new state that might rightfully expect some manner of influence on the choice. Of course, it was a military united Ru Russia under the Miladorosi banner, and their voice must be heard. There are likewise many strong industrialists who control countless factories and already exert a great deal of influence on the government. Likewise, the young Russian party itself would never be content to sit on the sidelines, and its opinions should also be taken into account. Lastly, the people who are the natural source of political power should be not deprived of a voice either. Kazimbek had already finished a rough plan for the structure of the upcoming Zemsky Sabor. Moreover, Alexander Livovich was inspired by the principles of the council convened at the time, end of the time of troubles in 1613, when the fate of the country as a whole was being decided. He wanted the new council to acknowledge and reflect the strengths of the old, whilst updating its composition and objectives. The realities of the 20th century of the 20th century. After reflection, Captain Beck decided that the council itself should consist of 200 delegates. The first 100 delegates would be representatives of the people. The people would vote for their representatives according to a majoritarian system of election, and their representatives would reflect the interests of various districts. The remaining 100 people would be representatives of the military, industrious and prominent uh, party leaders, who through their own personal judgment would decide that which prospective ruler to vote for. These interest groups of society would become a replacement for the outdated concepts of boyers, and the four groups of electors together amounted to the four modern states of society. These 200 people would have to converge around only one candidate, and their choice would seal the fate of Russia for generations. The majority rules in the candidate Sergei Belzersky. The very first candidate for the Russian throne, Sergei Belzersky, is an old friend of Kazimbet, having known him since before the Great Patriotic War. He is indeed a good candidate for the Russian throne, and is clear provide approvable descent from the Urovich line. Belzersky is 19 generations removed from the line, and the connection itself provides him with a pedigree that most other men lack. Sergei is also a very experienced commander. During the First World War, he showed himself as a good manager, being the staff captain of the Horse Life Guards. A little later, he joined Yudinich's army as a chief of staff of the Second Corps. After the Civil War, he left for the United States, began serving there as an Air Force Major, and after the fall of the USSR and the defeat of the West Russian Front, he returned to Berezniki. Despite a fairly rich military background and a closeness to the royal blood, he was nevertheless viewed as a rather mediocre figure, that is, until, of course, recently. With the beginning of the battle for Western Russia, he gained uh, quite a serious influence among the military elite, having established himself as an extremely outstanding leader and commander. His visions, if not adored, came to at least be respected for the fact that he himself did a lot of win of this battle for Russia. Indeed, the people themselves who witnessed the ascent of the young Russians observed that this all happened not so much at the will of Kazimbek alone, but was done thanks to the efforts of Sergei Belozersky. 
The Belzerski is respected not only by the common people, but the party as well. He's one of the old members of the Mladorossi. And within this organization, he'll be able to secure good connections and center of support. Finally, he may have a very strong chance of winning votes from the economic elites that they own the military industrial complex. These industrials see an excellent opportunity in Belzerski to make additional money and will therefore be inclined to lend them their support. In general, if we weigh up the circumstances in Belozersky's favor, it will be fair to assume that he will surely become the ruler of Western Russia, the invitation of Zemsky's of war. Army, people, king. How's the world trying to try to invade? Hopefully we do okay. I, I kind of hope they, they try to raid us as well, but we'll see. They don't have a lot of manpower, which is good. Candidate Mario Romanova. Mar Mario Romanova was not only 10 years old, a serious rise to the Russian throne. She is a princess of the Romanov family, which was overthrown about half a century ago. No matter how strange it may sound, the mention of the Romanovs among the ordinary population is recently evoked. Oh, look at all this stuff. Um, those workers. Um, evoked, uh, if not nostalgic feelings, at least a degree of honor and respect. During Bukharin's time, a serious campaign was carried out to slander the name of the Romanovs, but it was not effective enough to permanently tarnish her legacy. Oh, look at that. Even if the fact that Vladimir III was an actual Nazi collaborator revokes far from the un unambiguous feelings from a the population. Mary, despite her young age, can technically claim the Russian throne, but she will not be able to rule alone because no child could ever reasonably be entrusted with such a duty. If you were to briefly assess her prospects, you might get the impression that she has a better chance than Belzerski. It's clear, however, that her young age will count significantly against her. The prospect of a continued regency until Maria reaches her majority is unpalpable to many. There is a solution that makes much, life much easier. Kazanbek is already a region, but he can continue in his role in the service of of Maria and serve as a center of power in the state. Of course, if Kazanbek is nominated as Maria's regent, then the people would be voting not so much for Maria, but for Alexander Livovich. Kazanbek is very popular among ordinary people since he united much of Russia, although obviously not without the help of Belzerski. Among the people, it's believed that Kazanbek developed the strategies that led up to victory, and that Belzerski merely put them into practice. It's no surprise that uh, many people should therefore continue to rule a country in some capacity. Many fear that a premature transfer of power could deprive Russia of competent leadership, once again exposing Russia to the devastation of civil war. This state of affairs, of course, will likely please Kazanbek, who may not want to leave politics so quickly after all that he's done. This proposed coalition of Maria, Maria Beck has great potential, but it's worth remember that Kazanbek may only rule so long as Maria is a child, and cannot rule alone. What will happen after that is anyone's guess. Virtue, unity, strength. I'm going to do this one. Time to choose. Why do we have three options, then? The imminent meeting of the Zemsky Sabor is widely known and anticipated by other people, of course. The voting process will begin this coming Sunday, and Andrei Morozov, an ordinary turner of the plan, has just already decided to exercise his right and vote for a candidate. One night he moved over to who to support, having struggled to reach a conclusion beforehand. Sunday came, and so he went to the polling station and was handed his ballot with the name of the candidate, taking a penny, finally ca decided to cast his vote for her blank. Well, overall, I asked you now in the last video, but the first video, of which way we should go. And overall, there's support for at least you know this side, and maybe not so much for this side, but as well as people are. And overall, at the time of this recording, there's more support for... The People's Tsar. The election campaign is about to begin, and the political preferences of the people are far from clear. Alexei Kosich and Romanov will not be judged purely on his deeds and his merits, but on the elaborate hoax that has been forced to invent to be a candidate from the first place. Many people are naturally skeptical that Tsarevich or Alexei could possibly survive at all, and we must accept to assure them that their skepticism is unfounded. We have serious competitors who, unlike our newly anointed Tsarevich, Alexei, need no further explanations or undoubtedly the people they are claiming to be, in spite of their lack of actual political qualifications. This lack of complications granted them an initial head start in popularity. We must therefore tell our story without hesitation. Because this is a Belozersky, so, but, you know, a lot of people want with the people Tsar, so, okay. <clears throat> now, don't get me wrong, I want to do, like, all, maybe all these routes eventually, if I can do, really do them all, like, mentally do them all, but we'll see. Every minute Tsar. Now that we've enlisted the support of the former Tsar and begun to dominate the news of the media, we must return our focus to issues that matter to the ordinary people. Even people who are the best ag tag and agnostic on whether Kostyan truly is a Tsar of its return, they are at least now receptive to his words and promises, allowing a man to play it to his strengths as a politician. A conversation with the past. <clears throat> Kazanbeck read an article in the newspaper some time ago he still retains it in his archives, but evidently little of what the paper contained had any relevance to life today. While it wasn't exactly news, he'd retained the paper for a single story that had taken his interest. A front page report that the alleged the Comey politician Alexei Kostichin was in fact Alexei Romanov is in disguise. Although sensationalist, Kazanbeck felt it prudent to retain the article in case he needed to refer to it in the future sometime. And the moment has come. Alexei Kostichin had through chance of good fortune and secured another chance for his political career in the Malad Dorosi party. In fact, he came to work in Berezniki itself, working under the close supervision of party loyalists as he shared his, his expertise. Kostichin, having finished his work for the day, came to Kazanbeck's office at exactly the point in time. Greetings were exchanged, Kostigin sat down at the table, Kazanbeck, after a final look at the newspaper, put it between the two of them and spoke. Why'd you come? The Zemsky Sabor is at stake, and its main candidates are already known. Of course, I sincerely believe in the success of the Zemsky Sabor, but what if something unexpected happens? 
For example, Kazenbeck asked curiously, <clears throat> Let's say there's equal votes between Marie and Sergei answered Kostagin. You seriously think that's a likely prospect? <clears throat> Kostagin nodded. Well, consider that Belozersky is quite popular among the people, but Maria might appeal to many uh, to enable you to rule a country for longer, granting the two candidates equal level powers or levels of popular support. <clears throat> what do the people struggle to decide? Popular opinion does not always provide for decisive outcomes, as I have seen many times before in the Republic. After a little pause and a happy glance at the newspaper in front of Cousin Beck, he set out his plan. I could become a new candidate for the Russian throne. I'm fully aware of the claims made about my identity, and I believe I can provide enough evidence to su substantiate my rights to the throne as Alexei Romanov. <clears throat> Uh, <clears throat> Kazenbeck looked bemused. In all honesty, I can offer you the opportunity to become a unity candidate in the event that the votes are distributed evenly between the Roman Nova and Belozersky. That is, you'll be a figure who will either attract votes in a second ballot and allow the other ones to win, or you could be elected yourself and become a ruler who can consolidate sport. Kostagin looked surprised. So you agree? I will have the opportunity to become a candidate? Kazenbeck looked closely at the paper as he replied. Yes, it seems like it might be necessary. But the only thing that supports your legitimacy is this newspaper and whispered rumors. You know, I think under the certain conditions, people can be led to believe that you are indeed Romanov. The path of victory for Kostagin was narrow, but he had clearly made a significant breakthrough. If he gained power, the destiny of Russia could change dramatically. He could only hope and pray that the Zemsky support could not decide on anyone else. A little later, Kostagin asked Kazimbeck another question. Why are you so worried about the result of the Zemsky support anyway? Why can't you just continue to rule alone? I myself, perhaps, would like to rule the country, but I have already have discharged my original role. To prepare the country for a future king or queen. I am the region, announce myself as such to the whole world, and I cannot have official use of power. Nor can I change the fact that our ideology presupposes the existence of a king. I cannot become a king because, although I am of noble blood, there are those who are more worthy to become such a monarch. Cousin Beck had spoken. The conversation with the past had ended. <clears throat> Every man of Tsar. Profitable proposition? The legacy or legitimacy of Alexei Kostagin Romanov once resisted solely on the kind words of a few gutter pressed journalists. A push or crack bot theories of the lost Tsarvish or the narrow audiences before the unification of West Russia had even begun. <clears throat> if we want the people to choose us, we must find a credible advocate for Kostagin's claimed heritage and move beyond the conventional campaign methods that we have so far relied upon. We've been fortunate enough to be able to secure a meeting with the former Tsar Vladimir III, who was held under his house arrest since the fall of his own regime. With his own daughter is one of our opponents, we must make a lucrative offer to entice him to come to our, over to our side. <clears throat> People Tsar, Alexei Kostin, who decided to take on the role of a surviving Romanov prince, is of course an experienced politician who deeply understands the people and their needs. And Comey, his party has been able to flourish for no small part due to its close connection with popular causes and his ability to deliver on the bread and butter issues that were so often ignored by political extremists on the left and right. He was, however, merely big fish in a small pond. His reputation outside of the Comey Republic has proven rather minimal, and while people might have heard his name, they know little of the man himself. <clears throat> for those who don't doubt his claim of royal blood, he is merely a charlatan, an apostle who has come to usurp the throne for his own noble ends. The perception needs to stop. Alexei Kostin. <clears throat> He has declared himself to the whole of Western Russia as a surviving legitimate heir to Nicholas II. To convincingly demonstrate his claim, he needs to do more than just appoint campaigners to canvass on his behalf. The Tsarevich must make his presence known in the homes of every Russian voter, introducing himself to them through constant appearances on radio, in the newspapers, and through the TV channels, reaching those Russians not fortunate enough to own a TV set. <clears throat> Information must not flow faster than anyone is able to refute it, and Alexei Kostagin must deliver performance after performance to make a new name for himself as Alexei Romanov. <clears throat> Success will require close collaboration with media moguls. Kostagin therefore reached out to Gregory Segev, the owner of several of the TV and radio stations of Berzniki, Artyom Konolovov, the owner of several newspaper publications in Karel Beryokov, the manager of magazines and other periodicals. First, uh, from first contact followed a number of pre uh, generous promises and financial incentives, and so began a fruitful partnership with which Kostagin was able to introduce himself properly to the people. With Konolovov's help, the Romanov Prince was a frequent st star of the newspaper front pages, complete with the growing, uh, glowing reviews of his humanitarian work and his generosity towards his people. <coughs> The papers were quick to report Kostagin's donation of a tractor to an impoverished village, and the immediate benefits they enjoyed as they were able to use a tractor to improve irrigation channels across the land. His donation of several thousand rubles to help fund a lo to help the orphanage, orphans of the past wars was also quickly reported, and from the story to the story, it was ever clear that Kostagin had gone far more for his money than Leaflet and Post could have ever done to place him in the public eye. Kostagin made very good use of his appearance in the airways as well. His appearance as uh, Gre Georgi Sergei's guest on an edition of Glass Rossi. Uh, saw um, and hailed as a special guest, and his voice carried to the homes of countless loyal listeners. The voice of Russia <coughs> announced to ask gentle questions, granting Kostagin plenty of leeway to tell the story that he wanted to tell. To be asked if he was adopted son of Bukharin himself was enough to make the strange talking Kostagin a squirming a seat. He was fortunately able to regain his composure quickly enough to tell the telltale that he had prepared to Sergei's obvious, obvious satisfaction. And possibilities became possibilities, which morphed into reality, and the more listeners heard the words of the Tsarevich, the three questions they had, at least for the moment. Sounds legit. And candidate Alexei Romanov. Alexei Kostagin was a prominent politician in Komi. As leader of the liberal faction in Komi, he wielded a significant influence within the democratic system in Komi. Despite the fall of the Republic, Kostagin has already managed to recover and rebuild his influence, becoming a prominent new figure within the Mladerosi. 
His influence within her party had been fully reinforced by his early achievements and embellished with tireless work to improve, improve and consolidate the system we have built. Costume amazed people with those outstanding mathematical abilities from birth. Multiplying large numbers in his head, he could solve problems in seconds that would take other people's minutes or hours to work out. He was clearly the smartest among his peers after the revolution, he began to manage a cooperative and noble so beers could earn as much money as one could safely earn within the new social system. His cooperative was one of the few profitable ones amidst a general picture of economic stagnation in Bukharan time. Later in the pre-war career, he became to manage his the textile factory in Leningrad, and after the USSR's defeat, he ended up in Komi, where the democratic regime was eventually established. <clears throat> Just recently, rumor had begun to circulate that Kostyukin was none other than Alexei Romanov, who miraculously survived the night of June 6, July 16, 1918. The newspaper that first put the claims into print in Komi caused some sensation, providing some fairly compelling evidence in favor of the credible claim. Supporters of the theory uh, draw attention to the fairly close facial features and point further to similar character traits and intellect said to have been exhibited by the missing prince. With this established, it's claimed that Alexei Romanov became the adopted son of Bukharin and given a new history and its surname. Kostyukin's unusual wealth and power during the time of Soviet rule were often cited as the reason why his publicity of available, a publicly available, available biography was impacted to deception. Nevertheless, the wider public have remained very skeptical of the theory, with many considering it to be an absolute absurd joke or delusion of the reactionary class. Despite the incredulity of the people, Kazimbek has considered the claim sufficient reason to allow him to become a candidate for the Russian throne. So this will allow the Zemsky support to decide on his merits and claim it. His chances of becoming a ruler are very slim, though. Kostyukin, whoever he really is, is still known while he owns a Soviet bureaucrat and liberal leader, and claims regarding his true identity was largely confined to the Rokomi Republic. As though Kostyukin continues to be very close to the common people and still upholds democratic and egalitarian principles, a persona rather far removed from the popular history of the Romanov family, his power, if somewhat, somehow to be elected, will be found upon very little legitimacy, so it will take some time to convince the majority of his claims to be the throne. For similar reasons, the military hierarchy and the intelligentsia have grave reservations about the suitability to rule. He you know, his only pre-existing base of support comes from industrialists, who hope for looser state regulations of the economy, although the majority still lean towards Belozersky. My strength is the love of the people. Every man at Tsar. Gostjim was once more sitting in the uh, Glass Orosi studio, enjoying his chance to speak to the people in what had become an increasingly regular feature of the radio's broadcast stations. Or radio stations' broadcasts. While Belozersky and Kazimbek were stuck shouting from the street corners and handing out leaflets, Gostjim had the benefit of being able to speak to people who did not care to read a ponderous list of promises from a politician. Kostyukin's campaign developed their new campaign slogan to be eye-catching memorable. The Every Man at Tsar program promised the people a guaranteed standard of living, promising an end to the granting poverty that typified the lives of ordinary Russians for so long. It promised the institution of, of outer work benefits, state pensions, minimum wages, and the construction of public housing blocks so to house anyone unable to find a place for rent. Uh, what was their object to? <clears throat> Uh, the cost, of course. Somewhat surprisingly, they decided to give broke from his usual conciliatory tone to press Kostyukin on the expense of all his proposals. If Russia could truly promote the well-being of every system, why couldn't Bukharin's own idealistic regime succeed where others have failed? Kostyukin nodded in affirmation. What Bukharin lacked, he claimed, was the foresight to empower each man to shape his own destiny. Russia was rich and wrapped throughout the Washington with manpower, but no such plan could ever be sufficient to ensure that every man and woman did their part to tap it all. People who knew they will always have to wear their bread in a warm hearth the rest by could focus themselves fully on uplifting the country. A security of a compassionate state would drive productivity to ever greater heights. The wealth that is generated will be repeatedly shared out across the country or the economy to create millions of new Russian consumers, and the increased wealth will grow the economy once more. <clears throat> Sergei so looked pleased by the response before looking down at a note that had just been passed from drone broadcast. Uh, one or more astute listeners has called in to tell us about a former American politician in, or called Huey Long, but a program much like yours. Would I be right th to think he was your inspiration for this grand idea? Who? I've never heard of him. I thought America was a republic. Future technologies. We've gone to great lengths to popularize ourselves with the people, and we must now turn our attention to another great pillar of the electorate, the army. Their influence on the country's outside and the unusual system of election of the Zemsky support means that the vote of a man in uniform counts far more than an ordinary citizen. Let's make overtures to the army and let them know that they are the kings who ride into battle. Every man a king. Why do we have 14? Got enough energy? Mm, a little bit of debt. Oh, we're spending a lot of nuclear stuff, but not really. We are, but not really. I'm just going to wait and convert these guys. A great option. Writing to a man of noble birth was not a task that Kostyukin was accustomed to. Even without actual errors in the text, he cannot shake the feeling that every line and letter of his words could be misread as some slight of vulgar act of verbal assault on a man more gentle than himself. Hello. Hello. <clears throat> Imagine the old Tsar becoming incandescent with a rage as he read the presumptuous words of an ump jumped a prole scrawled haphazardly across a sheet of paper before him. No matter, he could do no better than what he had already written, but he, and he could only hope that Vladimir would be more reasonable than he feared. Your Highness Vladimir Karelovich Romanov, I'm writing to you with the uh, best intentions with the hopes of a prompt reply to this letter. I wish your family prosperity and well-being. 
I'm writing because I'm in search of your support, and because I wish to make you a proposal that I will be of interest to you. You already know doubt that I put myself towards as a candidate in the forthcoming Zemsky Sobor, and the outcome of which will reverberate through Russian history for generations to come. Alas, I do not really have the benefit of your family's noble pedigree. I'm not so foolish to accept to convince you, or attempt to convince you, that I'm truly the lost Tsar, Tsar Vesheloxi, but I hope that you'll come to understand the reasoning behind my deception. <clears throat> Like you, the nation I tried to build was curled in its infancy by the expansion of the young Republic state, despite this, or a young Russian state. The meandering course of history has provided me and those who support me with a new opportunity. It falls to us to work within the new system to build a Russia that is fair and places the welfare of its people as the highest concern. There are many who are yet to be convinced, but with your help I believe we can win those who are currently too consumed with doubts towards my claimed heritage to lend me the support. Your Highness, I understand the pain you must feel for being separated from your daughter. If I win, I will ensure that she has returned to you without delay, and that your family is left in peace as an honored junior branch of the royal family. It pains me to make such a presumptuous request of you, but if you can treat me as your own family, I will likely treat you as mine. Placing the letter in the envelope, he asked the courier to take the letter to Vladimir himself, <clears throat> away from the watch of government postal censors. Um, it took only three days for the courier to return with a reply in hand, as much as Kostich and fear the letter began with an angry tone. For shame, wrote Vladimir, that before that turner's son might declare himself royalty. As the letter continued, the indignation of the writer gradually turned, taking on a more diplomatic character. Although he had promised not to interfere in politics at all, Vladimir stressed that the thinly veiled captivity of his daughter wrote what little trust he could place in Kazan Beck, though it might demean him. He could not refuse an offer that would see his beloved child released back into his care. Costume was at least on paper anointed as Romanov. Welcome to the family. Elections. The bets are made, the die is cast, the Rubicon has been crossed. We did such a job before the elections and the Zemsky Sabor. Now it's time to start these very elections. The people, army, party, and the industrial elite must make their choice and step forward to the future. Why do we get 100? No. Research speed would be increased by... There's, uh, there's nothing for us. It does nothing. Oh, yeah. To the future. Schools. Oh, the military had an alarming amount of influence in the country. It was to, thanks to them that the Mladerosi state prevailed in the war for the Western Russia. And beyond the cities and towns, the continued presence is crucial to preserving the order and avoiding the return of the banditry. <clears throat> Their influence has been reflected as a separate electoral constituency for the military, with soldiers able to elect far more representatives than their actual numbers ought to enable them to. It is to be expected that they would want to vote for someone offering them money in good conditions, thus their primary opponent in his endeavors is Sergei Belozersky. Belozersky is not only respected and revered for his military service, but also respected for the huge amount of time he's devoted to promoting the interests of the armed forces within the state. He's ready to spend millions, if not billions, of rubles to maintain the army in the highest elite the highest possible state of readiness, and secure the defense of Russia from all threats. Although Maria's campaign has likewise made overtures to the armed forces, it's clear that, just, that has swung behind the candidate most aligned with their interests. <clears throat> if we want to get at least some military electorate, then we must make an offer equivalent to Belzerski's expectations. Kostich and Romanov, speaking on the next radio issue of the Glass, Rossi has talked about what he would do with the army. He talks about how much money, or how much the army is needed in modern realities, and has come to the conclusion that the army is needed, especially in the current reality, because of the army, our enemy still surrounding Western Russia. The presence of a strong army today is a guarantee of the independence of the state, and, is also, it, and it is also that it can protect the welfare of citizens. After all, it, he came to the conclusion that the country needs an army not massive but modern and first class. It must be ready for all cases in the war. Skills <clears throat> will not be superfluous, uh, superfluous, superfluous. But in addition, we are beginning to become an obsolete. We need first class weapons that will give us advantage over the enemy for decades to come. Therefore, Kostich and Romanov indicate that it would be necessary to develop new weapons, and if necessary, even those category from super weapons. The military, after such a radio release, began to seriously think about voting not for Belzevsky, but for Kostich and Romanov. At least half the military voters doubted Kostich and Romanov's military plans, but the second part still thought that it was still worth voting for Alexei. As a result, there is a division of votes in this electorate for Belzevsky and for Kostich and Romanov. The army can be sure of what I had promised. And yeah, we'll see what happens. Pay debt. 2%. Not bad. And we still have some growth and yearly surplus. Now that we no longer have attempt tax, like, or tax cuts and stuff like that. Actually, I'm going to go with tax cut. We have a planned economy right now, too. Get more growth. Eh, yeah, we'll see. Don't have to do that, so. Looking pretty good overall. More rudimentary uh, manufacturing lines, too. Which isn't bad. Well, this is going up, too, which is actually not... Which is pretty decent. Oh, it's not bad. Expertise. Three. Research studies coming up. Victor of Kostigin and Romanov. Well, uh, Kostigin and Romanov is in people. who well, con contact the election campaign. We're sitting in the hall. The Zemsky support. Election day has come, which would have decided the fate of the country. The main votes have been counted. But we'll need to find out how many voters voters will vote for specific candidates. 
The waiting was painful enough to get tired. The minutes seemed long, although it was possible to embellish your expectation with lively conversation and snacks. Tellingly, Kostic and Romanov did not drink alcohol, only water and juices, which looked very unusual among the elite who liked to drink champagne. A comfortable chair at one point of waiting began to seem not even comfortable at all, and at the very same time I wanted to sleep, but I couldn't do it because of the heavy waiting. There were 200 votes, but it was necessary to find out who was voting for whom. Finally, it became known how many votes for this or for that candidate. This was announced at 2 22 local time. After 22.15, after gathering all of the people in the single hall, the voting result was announced. Alexei Romanov with 51.5% of the votes, Romanova with 53, and Belozersky with 44. Romanov, Romanov, Alexei Romanov, was declared the winner. At Alexei's victory, Sergei Belozersky and Kazembek approached him. Kazembek started talking. Well, he did everything cunningly, of course. I didn't think he'd win. Kazembek said with a two-fold joy and surprise. Well, well, okay. The people chose you, said Sergei Belozersky. Thank you for make, thanking me for winning. But life doesn't end there, Alexei Romanov noted. Everything is just beginning. Oh, it's our reformer. Remove Karel and add Alexander, which gives you well, the same amount of political power. Yeah, you get nothing. Remove urgency. Okay, so we get more political power and stability. That's not bad. Um, you know, why do you want to read that? Please go ahead. I've read a lot already. Western people's. Western Russian people's. Princeton. Unexpected turn of events. Invade Onega? Pretty much. This is another research slot. That's nice. Look at that flag. Well, they, this is a submod called uh, Tsar and Soviets. We're a bunch of socialists now. Which I guess could be worse. But, at least we got it this way, so we can go and start doing land reform. Or uh, some other stuff like here. Now this one, increase GDP, repurpose Soviet infrastructure, expand the power grid. It's not bad. He gives more, way more weekly stability. Gives more war spark too, though. I'll give you that one, why not? It's not bad to do either. Weekly stability, and just that's that's so much stability. We get more worse border too. Eh, I'll give you that one first, why not? Let's expand the power grid. Cool. We also need to save some political power too, so. I don't like that we have to wait so long to do all this stuff. Oh, I forgot, we saw the dream. Our efforts to unite Western Russia ended with a complete success on all fronts. The young state, which gives hope for better dreams, is now the opportunity to take a deep breath and start moving forward in the dream of Mladerosi. The political leadership has chosen its own path, which would have been impossible without Kazan Beck and his team of people, but it's not over yet, no. Further, even greater achievements will await us, and in the end, we'll unite the whole of the Nazi free Russia. But in all in good time, in the meanwhile, we can reap the fruits of our efforts. Our dreams begin to be realized in full. You're going to win the battle, or you're going to die here. There is no half-assing in it. To win or die. This guy's level 8 attack and he still struggles. Sad. How many men have we lost? Oh, that's not bad. A thousand? We're forcing the attack? Even though we do have 27 combat with infantry, which is ridiculous that we can't win any faster. He's defensive though, which is okay, he's not great. Um, we're not only going to be, well, we're probably only be using infantry, but getting ambushers just in case is not bad too. Thank god, I hate this sometimes. Not bad. There you go. Uh, more factories. Uh, are we missing anything here? No, we're looking very good for the most part. Still, is actually not bad either. Um, I'm gonna get more planes. I mean, the planes are the, are the way of the future. So, early fires not bad. More castle. Integrate Onega. Thank you. Sports robbery, if you're ready for that, please go ahead.
Guys, go in. I want you to be very, very, very aggressive. Like, probably too aggressive. You don't have a lot of war support though right now, which does suck, but whatever. It's better. Better, not bad. Oh. Germany. Just doing a little German thing. This shouldn't take any time at all. But my god, it's going to take so much time. Which is incredibly stupid. So, maybe instead I do this one. Jimmy's finally come true. i do that instead. Yeah. Maybe. For the first time, Kaz and Beck could afford to have a good rest after all that happened in this relatively short period of time. I remember the still notorious 1962, he realized how much had changed in his life and how he achieved such unprecedented success. Until relatively recently, he repented for saving the library, albeit indirectly with the Nazis who helped Vladimir III in the West Russian War. What could Kaz be thinking about that at the moment? Probably only the fact that these events of the past have been left behind, and now there's no trace of collaborator behind him. The shameful stigma of traitor to the motherland and the murder of Russian people was washed away by a righteous desire to unite Russia and the virtuous deeds. We're no longer perceived as collaborators, we're not perceived as liberators of Russia and those who give hope for a bright future. Every Russian killed during the battle for Western Russia is the price he paid for the unification of Russia. In fact, he's very sorry that he has shed Russian blood again, but this time he did it not for personal purposes, but for Russia and the future of the sons of the motherland. A small price to pay for the most noble goal. It can be said unequivocally that it could not be then done otherwise here. And if we not sacrificed several hundred or thousands of Russian people, even more blood would have been shed already several hundred thousand people. Russia is looking to have the right people in the right place. Is it possible to say that Kazanbek led a campaign to atone for his sins? You could say that. As he redeemed his sins, he could have the Mladerosi state, which rose to its full gigantic height, and like a phoenix from legends, illuminated the whole of Nazi free Russia with its light. Our enemies did not understand and could not understand all the goodness of the moment, and they resisted us. And they paid for it, yes. We can say that we were able to atone for our sins, and now, having washed away the sins of the past, we can go with the f to the future to the young Russian's dream. Russia is alive and proudly marches forward. Redemption by blood for the sake of a dream for everybody. We don't have any focus. Is that it? Uh, I don't think this one's going to be bad. Sure, why not? Maybe to wait for, uh... Is the war to be over first, maybe? Maybe? Maybe. We'll see. Well, everyone, I made a mistake at the time of this recording. Um, only Belozersky has 10 years of content and no one else, which is quite unfortunate, so I do apologize. But we've done the first decrees. Now that Belozersky has become Tsar and the country stabilized, he can start creating the first decrees. Once upon a time, we sacrificed working conditions in order to prepare the country for the struggle of Western Russia. Now the battle for Western Russia has been won by us, we're thinking about how to make life easier for workers. After all, they deserve it. <clears throat> so we got all this. Integrating, or integration of officials. <clears throat> Our state unites vast lands from the Ural Mountains. To the border of Muscovy, this, however, is a very large territory which is very difficult to control. Due to the fact that we don't have enough officials in our state, there is a problem with the administrative burden, which does not give us the opportunity to develop the country normally. Even the decree that we have issued is being implemented with great difficulties. <clears throat> there are the Arab warring generals in the territory of Western Russia. These same pseudo leaders try to create a semblance of a state. <clears throat> Any state, even one that can only formally claim the title of such, needs officials, and these militant generals have succeeded in this. <clears throat> Therefore, we must integrate into our ranks those officials who will work for their masters. Even with this step, we will make it easier for ourselves to govern the country. Freedom of choice. At the present time, it is possible to rule the state by autocratic power. No matter how strong the ruler is, no matter how smart he is, he currently needs the support of the people and the government created with the participation of the people. The mistake in 1917 is that the Tsar was too far from the people, and the lack of a real connection with them further weakened the political power of the state. We will not allow this. Mladerosi ideology assumes that the people will also participate in the governance of the state. We must create a constitutional monarchical system where the parliament, where the main parties of the country will be represented, of course, not without some conditions. First decrees. Uh, Tsar, it's time to make the first decrees. What will you do? The advisor asked. So this is Belozersky now. Or Belozersky. How do you say his name? is Belozersky. Our first decrees and our first step, our respectively, my friend, will be the fulfillment of pre-election promises to his people. We promise to start developing the wealth for the people, and now it's time to implement our idea. Belozersky said with a certain tone of confidence. One industrial approve of such restrictions, the advisors said with some disbelief. After all, they're the ones who supported us in the Zemsky Civil War. They didn't approve of us for that. In addition, our working conditions must should not be critical in our nascent industry. Besides, they will not be very strong. Yes, we'll lose productivity in the factories in a certain sense, but workers now are suffering from overworking of the machines. The law that we issued before the battle for Western Russia now applies to the whole of Western Russia. We should not work now, and the very moment there's no need for it, therefore we must resolve this issue. As you say, I'm ready to work for you, or work with you. 
After a while, Belzerski carefully watched the ready-made decrees that his advisor prepared. Many times he refused certain decrees due to the dampness of the execution demanded from the subordinates. The sub introduction of the clarifications of force to polish every aspect of the issue to a shine, and in the end, Belzerski said that Finally, so that these variants of the decrees are worthy, they could be published. Finally, he put a signature that would help increase the welfare of the population, approved, put into effect. My apologies about this. Like, I, I wanted us to go the route you guys suggested, but uh, this, no, the route doesn't exist. So, and I did convert these guys all just like straight up infantry and stuff like that. So, whatever. It is what it is, you know. Overextended administration, which does suck, suck, suck. But it is what it is. Emperor Bao Dao. You improve infrastructure, which we'll never accomplish anymore. Um, TNO at the very least. Ooh, a little bit of lag. It's auto saving. But yeah, well, it's only 1966 now. So I basically I use consequence because I, I apologize for being frustrated in this campaign. But man, it, it, it kind of deserves to get frustrated at that. Kind of, kind of, kind of frustrates me. Is good. The new Soviets. One of the founding pillars of a government would be, have to be the Soviets. These councils that existed during Bukharin's reign were pretty good at managing economic problems in the local areas. Nonetheless, these councils were extremely politicized and couldn't act on their own without the help of the state, which led to the economic collapse of the USSR. We need to count this mistake and create new Soviets that adhere to the Mladerosi ideology. But even this matter can't be solved so simply. There are some who won't appreciate the creation of these councils and can't stand the term Soviet. That's why we need to create a way to create them in such a way that the people welcome them with open arms. So they never sight still, of course, which is good. This one's really good as well. Um, I don't need all these different templates. I already made the other one that we used pretty darn large already, so. It's got to 43 combo, which is not bad. I would like some uh, support companies, some more logistics, perhaps. That one's okay, but it's all right. Are you still fighting each other? No manpower. Oh my goodness. 30 divisions. Mario is losing out right now. Freedom of choice. Despite the fact that we want to avoid the mistakes in 1917, we must understand that it's extremely undesirable for us to go to the other extreme. The power of the Tsar and the power of the people should complement each other and not drag each other down. It's quite obvious that we've created a parliament. It'll weaken the position of official authorities. However, we cannot do without it because we will repeat the mistakes of Tsar Nicholas II. Therefore, we need to make the process of creating parties of the parliament difficult, if necessary, very, very difficult. So let's decide to prepare the creation of the parliament. Bill Zersky asked his prime minister, Pekazenbeck, to start preparing the reform of the, uh, of the creation of the parliament. This is a difficult task that should be entrusted only to an experienced politician, no matter uh, how strange it may sound, but Kazenbeck did not have to work for a long time since he already had some blanks initially. He initially understands the necessity and the dangers of the parliament and as such, therefore he immediately made a bill. Uh, according to Kazenbeck's project, the parliament should be called the Supreme Council, consisting of a thousand people, among whom 750 should be representatives of the Mladorosi. The remaining 250 are people who represent the other political parties in the country. Moreover, political parties should be created in accordance with a law which will be published in parallel with the law in the Supreme Council according to the plan. In order to create a batch, it is necessary to fulfill a number of requirements, of which there are about 20 pieces. Let's certainly complicate the task of creating a party that will be against the Mladorosi. The existence of such requirements will eventually lead to the creation of parties in the country that will be subordinate to the state. Present such parts will create the illusion of choice among citizens when in fact there is none. Everything's already been decided. Kazenbeck can outline the rights and duties of the Supreme Council. This authority can veto the laws of the Tsar, can put itself forward of laws to Belzersky, a proposed minister to the Tsar, and so on, but this is not enough. Kazenbeck proposed an option for Belzersky in the event of the crisis of powers, where the opportunity to take power to his own hands completely. Belzersky has already said his word. You know who to entrust such an important job to and he signed this bill with, his, with his approval. People are easily fooled. Oh, that's not bad. Uh, establish Prakazi. A government or co country is expanded to such a size where complete control over all state matters is no longer feasible. The already existing ministries can't deal with this overabundance of tasks that came with our successful unification in Western Russia. We need to reorganize how we control our country and create new central government structures. Admin strain, admin offices. Well, we can try it. We'll see what happens. That's a really good amount of surplus, though. Not bad. Get up to fair. Hopefully, can get even higher, too. I don't know why I can still buy stuff. It doesn't make sense why these guys are struggling so much. Of course, the Far East is still struggling a whole bunch as well, which does suck, but West Russian people are dumb. Nice and that eliminated that, which is not bad. 17 divisions. Not bad. New Soviets. 
new Soviets. The great truly allowed to RLC state. The next time is the creation of the Soviets. Councils are supposed to solve problems of local nature, and they'll be able to do this as long as they do not encounter a problem outside of the competence. Our territories are vast and need additional form to reduce administrative pressure on our state apparatus. In addition, we need to create a consist constitutional people's monarchy. In order to create a parliament, we need some kind of specific base, and this base will be found among these very councils. Well, we can simply introduce Soviets, but there are certain difficulties with this. There is a whole group of people in the country who are ardent anti-communists, conservatives, and reactionaries who do not tolerate this work. In their opinion, there should be no councils, or at best, they should be very limited. Of course, there will be a few such people, but they don't understand that we'll have other advice. Or, yeah. Blazewski instructed Kazimbeck to work, start working on the bill, and he almost the next day provided a draft for the establishment of councils. They said the council will be accountable to the population. This means that citizens will have the right to change a deputy if he does not satisfy their requests. The council is composed of citizens who are directly employed in the production, that is, performing public and state duties alongside the production activities. The status of a deputy is not a profession, but rather a related position. All elected officials who are separate from production are assigned a salary no higher than the average salary of a worker. The whole plan seemed very compromising. However, Belzerski asked a question about the councils that will form the Supreme Council. Who will be included there by party composition? Kazembeck said without thinking twice that the Soviets would have to consist of at least two-thirds of the ruling party members, in accordance with the laws on party registration, we can control their opposition. That's why we'll still not lose the power and the legitimacy of our government. Belzerski still decided to sign a version of the plan. It seems to be compromised for all groups of the population, since everyone can be elected to the councils. But at the same time, only those who have the right to vote, deputies from the council, and thus it turns out that we can satisfy the interests of both the people and the reactionary groups. The new in with the old. Land reform. The land reform. Uh, land problems always been hard to deal with for Russia. Peasants throughout their history have been surviving only by working for their feudal overlords, or landlords, or on collective farms for the government. Their labor was crucial, but its fruits have always gotten in the hands of those who want to enrich them only themselves or to income to people who couldn't do anything useful. We need help our populace in creating our own farms. Alexei Kostin, the economy minister, has uh, proposed the idea of tearing down communal farms and as a result create a motive for the villages to improve their own produce. In addition, he proposes we help villages mechanize their agriculture, decrease irrigation metrics, and finally, there needs to be funding allocated to the southern regions to alleviate the problem of systematic droughts. This measure will unquestionably unqu improve the status of our agriculture. Kostin's plan just needs to be signed. Prem uh, Prakazi said that everything is new as well old forgotten. Perhaps what will be discussed is very relevant, uh, since Belozersky decided to deal with the issues of administration at the moment. This issue is very important because overexpansion oppresses the state apparatus, which has only recently, relatively recently, appeared. Belozersky observes how some officials have, cannot cope with the amount of work they have. They uh, have, if not thousands, then hundreds of papers that some officials cannot handle. It's due to the fact that the responsibilities of some ministers are too huge while they have to work in more narrow specialities. What used to be necessary for ministers to work in many areas is now ineffective. We need to change the state of affairs. The Tsar, who wants the state apparatus to work more efficiently, instructed his friend Kazembeck to develop or draft a reform of the ministries. A few days later, Kazembeck, after conferring with the current ministers, provided a version of the reform to Belzerski. A reform by ministries in general solves the main problems of the administration, the workload of documents, and the broad powers and responsibilities of the ministries on various issues. They narrowed down all these param parameters significantly as a result, so all the problem with the administrative overwork or workload. In order to further destroy this problem and facilitate the governance of the country as a whole, it is necessary to establish a number of new ministries that would have authority on certain issues in the state. For example, the Ministry of Digital Technologies and Communications will be established. Belzevsky read and was impressed by the scope of the reform, however, he took a pencil cross out an inscription of ministries with it, writing Perkazi next to it. Kazimbeck raised his right eyebrow questioningly and frowned, clearly not understanding what Belzevsky was doing. The Tsar General told him, if you remember, I promised people to return to the good times of the strong people of Russia. These times coincide with the reign of Ivan III, the Great, and Ivan IV. I think she keep her promise. Kazimbeck grinned a little with a questioning look, nevertheless was forced to agree to the Tsar's decision. The new and the old, that's how you say it? Um, governor's, governor's borders. As soon as the fighting for Western Russia was over, problems surrounding internal problems arose. Many previous existing statelets didn't have concrete borders, but only nominal ones. Only our soldiers were able to make sure that nobody stepped outside or inside, or inside out. What the heck? Step inside out territory. That doesn't make any sense. Now our administrators are struggling with understanding what the, are the territories they're supposed to govern. This leads to farcical situations where two officials receive two identical reports for a single shared piece of land when nothing of sorts should even exist. Derived of this, concrete dividing lines are to be created between our country's territories, which are now to be called governance. Where the church? Yeah. No, that's not terrible. It would be better though. We're getting there. Land reform and uh, still sucks. Wait. Oh, okay, we still have this division tip on. What happened here? It's fine. 
question of the church. One of the most pressing questions or pressing problems of the state is the question of religion. Many countries practice Islam and some even usual strains of Christianity, even orthodoxy. Some political movements have proposed a state religion. Orthodoxy, to be exact, in their system it would be only the allowed religion, but while others would be banned. What others suggest is secular government. A choice has been made, or this problem will happen for us later on. Scapegoats, of course. Well, at least I can gladly say, not every single focus here has a event to read. Which, I don't understand, why, why would you need one? Well, most of them do still, but why? Reanimating the econ economy, not bad. Military police, the Priska, Priskas. Development of the training methods. Which is not bad, that's pretty good. Russian aviation industry. Embassy Priskas. Yeah, that's not bad too. Interest rates increased by 22%. Interest rates, eh, that's not bad already. I guess, yeah, interest, dead interest, I guess. That's inflation, my bad. Question of the church. And corrected party of uh, scapegoats. Every regime it has to prove it's better than the previous one, but our state isn't the only union successor, even though we took some things from them. Any simple thing can grasp that our state is more monarch monarchistic in nature than Soviet. That's why our subjects will compare a country with the Russian Empire. A certain part of people, especially the monarchist whites, think that the country was in the first prime was ruled by Nicholas II, but they need to be reminded of what he did to the country and where it led us. Keep working on that stuff. Is it still Bennett over here? It is. The Silver Act. Mm, Balding Borman, Thatcher, Wales, Wolf, Lemas. Social Democrats in Sweden, huh? Well, that's a lot more political power. Ukraine. Stahlecker. Oh, look at that. Von Heldorf. You're still fighting here, huh? Well, Zersky once again listened to the reports of his ministers that requests were written in various regions of the country to resolve the issue of religion. Bill Zersky got the impression that some want... Orthodox to become the only permitted religion, while others ask for a secular state in general. Belzerski was aware of that if this continues. It most likely interfere with the work of his administration in general will create tension, therefore it is necessary to set on some action. After hearing the national report, Belzerski thought a little and decided that, rely on the Orthodox majority. Well, let's take a look. Um, despotists. Mm, if you want to read about this, please go right ahead. Uh, a militarization of the army. Uh, so on the Soviets. Freedom for all? That gives us a bigger army. I don't go with that one for now. Remember glories of the past. We were exposed to the true face of Nicholas II and the consequences of his rule. This doesn't only get rid of the conservatives in our country, but on top of that shows the period of shame is over. The problem is that by reminding people that the past is behind us and we encourage them to think about our history, and that brings them to a question. Was there anything good? Russophobes from inside and outside the country might use this and give the people a depressing and harsh answer nothing. But Russia is just a state run by barbarians from the east. To counter their influence, we need to return to the times of the, to the, times of the rural kids. Our Tsar General Belozurski is himself a distant relative of theirs. Because of this comparison, will not only legitimize the government, but will remind our people that there is glorious times ahead. Hopefully. That's a $600 billion def in deficit. Or deficit. Debt. Hopefully. Hey, yeah, it's going down. It's great. The scapegoats. Newspaper article. Legitimacy of many states often rests not in the worship or veneration of the past, but in the condemnation of all the old, exposing all the worst, and bringing it to the absolute. First of all, this characteristic of such, a, of such regimes that have been recently come to power and are trying to establish a solid foundation for legitimacy. Support of the population. Unfortunately, there are many in our country who believe that it is better under Nicholas II than even now. That's partially true, but their blind faith is now deceased. Uh, Tsar is now in the, in the now deceased Tsar, undermines our legitimacy, and one can put up with this if not the popularity of such trends. 
Bill Zersky continued to contact multiple printing pr magnets in order for him to commission the preparation of a series of articles on the topic of Nicholas II and negotiations with these magnates. So our general set out one condition, expose all the troubles and the, all the fears of the reign of Nicholas II. Oh, look at that. <clears throat> and show how bad he really was. For which he promised in the future to give them bonuses on path of the Tsar himself for a very large sum of money in addition. In order to avoid what will happen after this growth of communist ideas, we'll also have to blame the Bolsheviks and Lenin for the defeat of the Russian Empire in the First uh, World War. After some time, the editor of these na same newspapers will make several articles on this topic, if you read carefully. You find a sharp criticism of the reign of Nicholas II and all of his actions. Those things, the little that was good in the reign of the Tsar, was also turned into failures and failures, and everything was thrown off of N Nicholas II. Many managed to catch his time, gave an ambiguous reaction. Many of them were not happy that such a glorious time, from their point of view, was turned into a shameful one, but the bulk of the population believed in these main theses. Many articles that accused Nicholas II of incompetence ended with attacks on the Bolsheviks led by Lenin. The writers of the articles come to the conclusion that Lenin, instead of saving Russia from defeating the war, only pushed it into the abyss, unless they are also guilty of the fall of the empire. In total, it turns out that both Tsar Nicholas II and himself and Lenin and his communist clique are to blame for the fall of Russia during this period of time. Communists and conservative white guard were left without the support of the population. Now the influence of these elements will significantly decrease. The one who controls the past controls the future and lessons from Zubatov. It's an open secret that workers' unions are good at spreading communist ideas, which also our government and plunge our country back into anarchy. Even though we understand that most things Nicholas II were not sustainable, there's also some implementing that are worthwhile. The idea of police socialism was able to hold back the revolution for a long time and let the empire live. Sergei so Zubatov, the main proponent of Skonsa, was a worthy servant. <clears throat> who destroyed the revolutionary cells that head behind the facade of unions. We need to employ his ideas for ourselves and use his methods against subversive elements. 1.4 billion, eh? More than... Eh, about two-thirds of the way there. Got tiny little specters of groups here. Our legendary past. Vasily, a high school student, came to a history lesson. Since he is now studying in sixth grade, he is studying about the period of centralization of the state. And since they're not the first lesson of the period in the class, his class is already studying the times of Ivan the third of the grade. The teacher tells with such interest, as if he himself had witnessed all the events that happened during this period, that the students, even those who were not interested in history, listen with bated breath. Many students drew pictures of those events in the heads, the conquest of Novgorod, standing in the Urga, the deliverance of Russia from the Tatar yoke, as well as the creation of a single Russian state. These events aroused an admiration from the students, which was difficult not to feel. They aroused a sense of patriotism for the Russian people and for the past of many children. Some students, such as our Vasily, tried to draw a parallel with the current events that came to the conclusion that Russia will soon be united thanks to the efforts of our Tsar, General Belozersky. The realization of this fact made Vasily feel even more proud for his people and for his country, which will soon come under a single flag. Unfortunately, the lesson flew by too quickly. Many people were wanting to hear the continuation of the story, but they had to go to another lesson. Many people started discussing the to this topic after lessons after lessons. Vasily told his friends about this thoughts, and they also received some insight about the parallels of these events, and he received support in the form of approving statements to his words. Vasily's and friends were charged with the idea of uniting the entire Russian people against all of our enemies, and someday it will definitely happen. History is cyclical. In the creation of a constitution. The constitution of our country is to enshrine the rights and responsibilities of all other people. All the reforms that have taken place should be refer referred to this document, which establishes a constitutional monarchy. The rights of the Tsar shall be outlined as well as the duties of all branches of government, which in turn will share a symbiotic relationship between the Tsar and his subjects, but there shouldn't be a possibility of one branch overpowering the others. Both the Tsar and the Parliament should work in tandem for their mutual benefit. The constitutional project is almost ready to be sent into law, only a few corrections need, need to be done. Okay. There's a good amount of manpower to boot, too. Even though I. Why can't we do any region development, man? Why can't we do reunification of Russia? Because we've not done our political matters at first. That's why. Zuboshev, China. Zbelzersky was collecting reports for the past month in order to make at least for himself some kind of complete picture of what is happening in the country. He rejoiced that since the unification of Western Russia, the state under his leadership began to rise and develop rapidly. Only. One could only dream of such thing under Bukharin, and indeed everything was going quite well, at least it could be seen from the reports. Until Thorkyakov, Thorkyakov Ivanovich, the chief clerk of the internal security of Western Russia, entered the office. Before that, of course, he asked permission to enter, in which he received a positive response. He entered quickly enough, even though he was holding a whole stack of reports from the orders of the interior, on which there were about seven dozen, several dozen pe uh, pencil underscores about the real state of affairs. Uh, specifically, there were marked cases of rallies organized almost out of the blue for no particular reason. Threatyakov reached the table and put his stack of reports next to the reports of other clerks. What is it? Belzersky asked a question a few seconds later, clearly with the expression of incomprehension. This much, sir, said Threatyakov, picking up the utmost poor report and looking for notes that he had managed to take by, make up by this point. As a report, you know that we made trade unions in our country, right? Yes or no, let me guess. Did you come on this issue? Belzersky asked with some skepticism. Exactly. Judging by these newspapers that I brought you, underground communist cells have been operating in our country for a long time. They undermine the situation in our country by not showing themselves in public and pretending to be only members of a trade union. 
Because of them, our industrials are beginning to lose losses. And most importantly, they're beginning to push workers to uh, commit revolutionary activities. Probably this is an activity common from the Western Front. We still not accept defeat. Suppose you want to do something about it, Belzerski asked a question. Yes, uh, said the threat Yakov. We need to fight this. We have a good experience of the past, specifically my colleague in the shop and the person of Zobotov. This activity shows that it's, it's easy to fight the communist threat that is lurking right now up inside the trade unions. An interesting suggestion, said Belzarsky, was listening attentively to Tretyakov. I think I'll allow you to start developing methods to combat the scourge. It's very difficult to simply copy the Zubatovism in a situation. The reason for this is that the trade unions, although they undermine the economy in this way, as a result, do not do nothing illegal. Therefore, we must do something else. We are the trade unions and teach them not to act against the government or enterprises. We are trying to achieve a compromise in negotiations. To do this, it is necessary to understand the difference between the workers and the revolutionary movement. In the first case, the goal is a penny, and the second, an ideological theory. Such an explanation will allow our workers not to be provoked by the subversives of public opinion. Not everything old is bad. And correct the party. And even though the outside of our party looks united, inside of it there's a growing number of party members who aren't very happy about it. Sergeant General winning out in the Zemsky Sabor. This shows that the party isn't monolithic and now reflects in the amount of victory that surrounds every proposal of the powers that are. If we don't want this opposition to burden us in the future, decisive actions have to be done as fast as possible. Seeing this, Kazan Beck suggests expulsion of the opposition for the party via different methods, beginning with demotions for apparent misdeeds and ending with the sending these members into early retirement. Luckily, the number of people we need to get rid of is small, of course, but the population will support us if, the, if things go awry, won't they? And we'll read that one too, but I want to read something else first. Holy crap, why is it lagging this hard? Come on. Come on, TNL. Oh my goodness. Uh, reanimating the economy, probably. Now the West and Russia, no one cares about this stuff, as united one flag, the creation of a strong economy is the next necessary step. As I've said, a plan on how to fix and strengthen the economy has to be created. This can be achieved only if we were to utilize all the resources, materials, factories, uh, external trade networks, and men to the full extent. And the first conquest of the Soviets. And finally, after the initial reforms of the freshly baked government, we are ready for the last touch. The first conquest of the Soviets. This meeting will also include local administrations and different political movement. This event is crucial for a country as it will solve many problems and so resolve conflicts that piled up. It can't be compared to the Zemsky's of war, but its significance isn't so to be understated. Only seven days remain until the Congress convenes. What it will decide? Not bad. And we have no doubt. Doesn't help us out that much, but you know what? Whatever. Um, we do that. Not bad. Doesn't really help us out that much, though. Daily air XP and army XP gain? Does that actually affect us? Not yet. Air? I'll give it until the 15th of July to see if it does actually anything. I'm a little surprised we don't get another thing to do for, you know, regional development yet. Well, we wait until the 15th. And it says it gives us daily plus 0.15, but that's been a lie. Oh, that's monthly professionalism. No, daily air army XP gain. No, that's a lie, so it doesn't work. Okay, good to know. First Congress? Oh, there we go, finally. Let's go and do all that stuff, I don't care. Now we have way more debt. Whatever. Not like I really care that much. Surplus will take care of it. Really mediocre. Oh, we're close. Where are we at? So 81 out of 100. Plus 5 a month and 4 months. That'll be a fair. You get 5% more civility. That'll be great. Interest rates will go down. What's well, not to love? 6. Not bad. Uh, we're on mass mechanization already. Holy cow. I do apologize that we didn't get to go the route we really wanted to do. So, Admin efficiency. We're an illegitimate... <laughs> oh, crap. Do you know admin efficiency widespread corruption? Oh crap. Huh. Iberian economic crash. Nice. Fire relief. Nice. All good stuff. Wait, do we just do poverty relief? Why is it still 0.08? I don't understand the mod sometimes, man. First Congress to the Soviets. Kazimbek, the Prime Minister, and Tsar Belozersky entered a huge hall designed for a thousand people. There are about the same number of delegates from their council, self governing bodies, who represent their provinces and regions of the country. The overwhelming majority of their representatives were Mladerosi, and those who were not either were liberals from the PLR, Socialists, or the Labour Party. The whole hall filled up with these people at the side of the two main faces of the state, set up and greeting. Belozersky sat down in a special place assigned to him, standing behind the main persons of the state, as if towering over everyone. 
As asked was to see how the process was going at the Congress, Kazan Beck immediately ascended to the podium and began his speech. Dear friends, today we're gathered here to open the first Congress of Soviets in the history of the young Russian state, which will solve the accumulated problems in her state and determine the path of development of her state. In response to his statements, everyone began to clap with cast class casemate in order of opening of this very Congress. After the applause subsided, the Prime Minister continued to say on our agenda are the issues of administrative management and the further development of a young Russian state, so I suggest that we immediately begin to resolve this issue. After the short, short speech, the work of the Congress began. The country's top officials uh, identified the main problems areas in our young state. After that, interesting proposals for solving these issues began to put, put forward. In the course of discussions, uh, the worst decisions were rejected and the best ideas were adopted. Uh, this town Belzersky was just watched and sometimes entered. Uh, I've wondered about that as well. Entered, entered into conversation with officials. He just listened to what they had to offer to do, and sometimes gave advice in the right direction, although it was not as in his competence, but he violated this restriction and simply opted civil servants to his liking. After a week and a half of much such discussions, the First Congress developed a program of action for the next quarter. Administrative decisions were made aimed at eliminating the burden on the bureaucratic system. A plan for the economic development of the country was adopted. A plan for the development of foreign policy was approved, and most importantly, the working hours of the Congress were approved, though convenient every quarter. At the end of the convocation, Kazanbeck voiced all of this and thanked everyone for their presence and solutions to problems. The convocations ended with the anthem of the Maladarosi state. Congress over, the problems are solved. Well, that's really fast. Holy crap. Economic Lishika Prkaz. It's time to create the national economic order or the Ekonomishikiske Prkaz Narod Nogo Kozyasyastva. I can't read Russian. Which will be responsible for dealing with the economy as a whole. Everything from trading and production to the support of the small businesses will come under its control. The agency will make sure that the economy is expanding in every sector, that any conflicts are settled and government funding is put to good use. Right now, we need all the parts of the economy to catch up with the conquests. Our economy will match with the great powers of the world at any cost. Kostagin's order, the head of our economic ministry, will have his competencies expanded. This will give him the ability to quickly respond to any troubles that arise will be generally more effective. But if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe if you're new, check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow as we'll continue, or maybe in the next video, continue expanding our expa uh, uh, Sardom, and see if we can further expand further east. Thanks for watching. Have a great rest of your day.